Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison. I want to welcome you to this session of Humanity Rising. As we begin a two-day program on the Thanksgiving, that on Thursday, uh, American citizens from around the United States and the world will celebrate as a, one of America's most precious holidays. There's a lot of uh, mythology and tradition uh, to that first Thanksgiving, which we're going to be uh, getting into uh, in a moment. Uh, but before we do that, I want to uh, just take uh, a minute or two to uh, promote a course that is coming up through our academic partnership with Stan Groff. And I want to introduce uh, Marie uh, Castle, who's one of our PhD uh, graduates at Ubiquity University, who's been a holotropic breathwork practitioner for many, many years. And along with Ren Butler and uh, the Groffs is helping to develop uh, the courses uh, that you can take for a certificate in Groff studies uh, that you can then bring into Ubiquity uh, for a master's and a PhD uh, degree. Uh, Mari is one of the uh, core faculty of that program. So Mari, why don't you take a, a couple minutes and tell us uh, what uh, the course entails and, and when it starts and what it's about, and then uh, we'll proceed with our program. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jim. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, so uh, my course actually is The Power of Myth and Archetype, and it's starting today, so it's not too late. And, um, you know, I just, at first, I just want to say, Jim, I'm always impressed with your ability to interweave these different, um, sometimes very intense and heavy subjects of humanity and you have just have a beautiful uh, articulate way of doing all of this together. and um i'm back i don't know if you can hear me yes we can hear you barbara yeah and um i'm just giving my announcement here that uh yeah, I, you know, I remember coming to Wisdom Graduate School in 2010, and this was just after I had completed my uh, degree, my master's in transpersonal psychology, and my training in the Groff holotropic breathwork. And for those who aren't familiar, the holotropic breathwork is about accessing these altered or non-ordinary or holotropic states of consciousness. It was developed by Stan Groff, uh, who is a founder of transpersonal psychology and one of the um, you know, one of the founding fathers. And um, when he was he first started with the psychedelic research that then became prohibited in the early 1970s. And he went on with his wife, Christina, to develop the holotropic breathwork. So the reason I'm mentioning this as well, and Jim had mentioned this as part of the, uh, the uh, partnership with Ubiquity Groff Studies graduate program, but the power of myth and archetype course is specifically about bringing awareness and having this numinosity or this awe of mystery understanding of these holotropic states that emerge in our consciousness and that they you know uh that through psychedelics as well that we can have these experiences so um some of the archetypal material that emerges in these states is historical geographical symbolic it can be mythological as well and i just want to stop for a second and say, you know, I, I watched all of last week with AI and, and the week before as well. I'm sort of hooked on humanity rising now. Um, but AI, is AI an archetype? I think this is a good question. I think that we did. We created AI. AI is now an imprint, an archetype in our psyche. And that you know, the, these expanded states of consciousness are what allows us to have the creativity and the insights for growing 
So we want to grow. That's part of our uh, natural evolution. And then, you know, just to think that, oh my gosh, where we are already with Zoom. 10, 15 years ago, I don't remember exactly. We did not have Zoom. It's very recent, but we're only here on Zoom, right? So the possibilities with AI and other modern technology is that we're in this holographic universe. We can see each other, our full bodies. Maybe we show up as different avatars or characters and uh, come as how we're feeling that day. So it's just interesting and kind of fun food to think about uh, of the possibilities. And then considering what we're doing moving forward with these, uh, these possibilities with the holographic universe and like AI has had exponential growth that entering into these places we've never accessed before, either collectively, um, you know, or even uh, unconsciously. And, and I'm thinking of Carl Gustav Jung and his collective unconsciousness, but he often referred to the fact that we haven't reached the fourth dimension as of yet in his time. He said, you know, we we're in the, he talks about the heart chakra energy and that element of air and the throat chakra energy is the element of ether. So I believe we've entered into this fourth dimension now. So, wow, look at the, all the possibilities that we have to come from this. And just want to mention also Joseph Campbell as a mythologist, that his question always was, what is the myth of our future? I think this is it. We are in it. Yesterday, uh, discussion, Humanity Rising, was on the uh, UFO disclosure. So look where we're at today, you know. Uh, is our UFOs a myth? I don't think so, not anymore, it's a reality, right? So just um, thinking about all of these different concepts and that both Jung and Campbell, Joseph Campbell balanced the scientific and spiritual perspectives. So I believe it's worthy of their life work for us to continue to draw on these perspectives and to grow and move forward in humanity. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to thank you again, Jim, for letting me come in and that um, my I'll, I'll post my email and my website. And I also have uh, the Holotropic Breathwork workshops in Tampa, Florida. If you're interested, anybody's interested in that or wants to read more about that work. So I'll leave you all with that. And uh, looks thank like you, Mari. Thank you. It'll be such a pleasure. Yes. And All good right. luck with the course. It sounds absolutely fascinating. And I think you're right. I think we're now living the archetype of our future and uh, how we move into it. Uh, I love your notion of uh, AI as an archetype. Uh, that's, that's well worth pondering uh, very, very deeply. So thank you and good luck. Thank you. All right. Take Bye -bye. care. Now, everyone, we're going to shift our focus to a discussion about the American tradition and holiday of Thanksgiving. Uh, many have considered uh, American Thanksgiving to be our most precious national holiday. We have religious holidays like Christmas and Easter and so forth, but those are universal uh, in which we participate. Uh, but our Thanksgiving in the United States is a uniquely um, American holiday on a time uh, when uh, virtually nobody else in the rest of the world pays much attention, which is one of the reasons why we will have humanity rising on Thursday and Friday. Uh, but we thought this was going to be a, a, a very opportune time and year to explore it with uh, several people that have been uh, very much involved in humanity uh, rising. And uh, so I really want to uh, thank um, uh, um, Connie and Andrew 
who have been so uh, present and and supportive uh, along the way. And uh, Connie uh, Baxter Marlow, who uh, traces her actual ancestry to those people on the Mayflower uh, that uh, came uh, over. Uh, and Andrew has written a, a very comprehensive uh, novel, a mystical novel uh, on the Mayflower and the events uh, around uh, that first Thanksgiving uh, bringing in some of the complexities and layers of interactivity between the Puritan settlers that had just come in from England and the Native American tribes uh, who were there and received them and interacted in those first decades uh, after arrival. So uh, we'll get right into it. Uh, I'll introduce first uh, Connie, uh, who will uh, convene uh, the rest of the presenters for our program today. And at the end, I'll circle back for a final discussion. Thank you, everyone. Welcome to Humanity Rising. Uh, welcome, Connie. Thank you, Jim. And this is the Connie and Andrew partnership coming to you from Plymouth, Massachusetts, the ancestral home of the Patuxic, who were under the sachemdom of the Usamequin, the Massasoit Usamequin, the Poconocet sachem. And we have a Poconocet clan grandmother here with us today, as well as a uh, native scholar and pilgrim scholar and a uh, native peacemaker. And we're going to be speaking about the three great syntheses with Europeans and Native Americans on this day, two days before what's called the first thing, celebration of the first Thanksgiving that occurred here as a three day intercultural celebration in thanks for a great harvest with 50 uh, pilgrim people who had had just um, so who had survived the first winter after a great sickness and 90 plus Poconoca native people so it's it's a very wonderful time of celebration of synthesis of coming together in peace and friendship in our hearts and so we're taking an eagle perspective. I was told my name is Eagle Woman, and it is my job to fly very high and report back all that I see. And Andrew, my beloved husband, is also an eagle and sees very high perspectives. And he has a very broad historical sense. He's done a, a lot of research on uh, New England before the Mayflower, as well as he has a, he's from South Africa. He has a huge historical understanding, which I don't. I just get told from spirit, okay, read this sentence in this book, and he reads the whole book. So um, you'll hear different, um, different um, depth and breadth from each of us today. And so um, the point of this two-day forum is, in fact, to bring forth sacred activism and its role in the origin, evolution, and realization of the American promise. The American promise being liberty, justice, equality, and abundance for all. Which, and Marie brought forth something very important in her speaking about her course, and that is the vibration, the the, the frequency from which we see things. History is a perspective of from our vibration, of, from where we see things. And it's all energy and our vibration matters as far as what we see and what we project into the collective consciousness. So this the whole series, our, our two forums are going to be speaking from that spiritual perspective that eagle perspective, our higher law, however anybody wants to term it. And, and tomorrow we will be bringing in cosmologists, physicists, and astrologer, and spiritual activist expert to show you what in fact spiritual, sacred, conscious, subtle activism is and how to get there 
and what the new science is bringing forth for opening our hearts and taking us to a level where we can act from that vibration and bring that American promise to pass on earth where it is a given in a higher frequency. So I guess what we'll do now is we'll bring on everyone and if you can bring on everyone and um, we will introduce everyone. Everyone will go around and introduce themselves. Um, Andrew is my co-moderator, but he's also a panelist. So he will come on and introduce himself. I've done that so introduction of me and my um, and this whole forum. Um, and we will uh, now have each person come on and introduce themselves briefly. Um, Jim, if you can bring everybody on, um, that would be great, just so everybody can see everybody. But if not, I'm um, trying to do that. Okay. Uh, having a little challenge with Barbara. Okay. Well, hopefully Barbara will um, get that. Uh, we've been having some technical difficulties with Barbara, but we do need to see you, Barbara. So um, let's proceed and um, start with Betty. Um, if you could introduce yourself briefly and speak about what you're going to speak on. So two minute introduction. Hello, I'm Betty. I'm Cherokee. And I'm Blue Panther Clan. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, I hold a PhD in literature from the University of California at Los Angeles. And my areas of expertise are basically American literature with an emphasis on early American and Native American literatures. The focus of my work is to show that American Indians have in my view, totally the course women's has been obvious mm -hmm. and it's also been deliberate. And I use Bradford's history of Plymouth as the first example of this work. And today I will talk about the first meeting and how consciously Indians and perhaps subconsciously Plymouthians work together to achieve a peaceful era. Wado, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, Kevin, would you like to introduce yourself? So my name is Ganesom, I'm from Ganawagamua Territory, South Shore of Montreal. So I'm just going to talk about the influence of the Iroquois Confederacy on the fathers. Thank you. Great. And Andrew, could you introduce yourself, please? Hello there, everybody. It's good to be back on Humanity Rising, and um, what a privilege. Mari, I just wanted to say that I did a lot of work with holotropic breathwork and Stanislav Grof back in the 80s and into the 90s. Changed my life. Uh, earlier on, I'd done some psychedelic work, which also changed my life. So I've had that overarching experience of consciousness. And I just want to say that this forum, is about human consciousness. It's about the evolution of our species, the evolution of how we interact with each other, what role democracy might play in it. Very especially, Connie and I are the only non-Native Americans on this panel today, and I welcome and I'm so honored that you beautiful people have showed up for us today. So part of this it has to do with I don't think many people in the world, and Americans especially, understand the contribution of the Native American to what became America, 
which has a promise that is yet to be realized. It is yet to be realized. So there's this beautiful promise. So many people came to America with ex expectations of freedom and on and on. How do I qualify to speak on this subject? Well, I did a lot of research for this book, for example. It's called The Mayflower Revelations, taught me a lot. And how did I get involved? I found myself with a Mayflower descendant with whom I fell in love. And we were engaged for 19 years and we just recently got married. So this is a very special moment for us. And I'll just say this. I learned that there is so much misunderstanding of that first encounter between the so-called Mayflower pilgrims who were different from the Puritans, that were very different. They arrived here, 102 of them. We are looking out of the window at the bay that they came into. We're actually in Plymouth, Massachusetts. There's a replica of the Mayflower just over there. If I took the computer over there, I could show it to you. And there's so much misbelief and misunderstanding, and the actual history is much more positive and much more beautiful than it is currently believed to be. We're in the week of Thanksgiving, so we do this thing of giving thanks. But here in Plymouth, it's interesting, and I'll end with this. On Thanksgiving morning, descendants of those pilgrims, the, the ones who survived the first winter, dress up in costumes and they march up to the burial hill where their ancestors were buried, which is just uh, maybe a mile from where we're sitting. And the native people gather on a stage down by the water and they have an event called the National Day of Mourning. Mourning with a U, grief. And it is an honoring and an opportunity for Native folks to get up and express themselves. And I'm really, really proud of this town for hosting that. All right, so that's where we are. That's who I am. And I'll be back to talk further. Yes, indeed. We look, look forward to more from each of you. So now what I'm going to do... Oh, Barbara. How's Barbara? How are you doing with your how's sound? How's sound, Barbara? Hi. Oh, yeah. There you are. We've been having technical difficulties. So, Barbara, would you introduce yourself, please? And then you can go straight into your song. You're doing opening prayer and song. So we can all shut down our... Um, when we're not speaking, it's very important that we each unmute. I mean, we each mute ourselves. And so, Barbara, would you introduce yourself, please? And then go into your prayer and song and a little bit of... Um, of letting us know your thoughts. Okay. My name is Barbara Kerfus. My native name is Wamsuda, which means loving heart. I'm a descendant from Quattaquina, the brother of the Massasoit. The Massasoit is, that's his title. His name is Os Osamequin. And my story is I believe that we're all the children of our creator. Some call him God, some of us call him creator, and some of us call him the great spirit. We call him Katahdin. Um, I'll go into the prayer and then I'll sing a song and I'll talk more after. Let us pray. And before we pray, Taniska uh, Anawayan, I just said, thank, welcome all my relations. Great Spirit, I thank you today. I thank you for Mother Earth. I thank you for Grandmother Moon. I thank you for Grandfather's Son. I thank you for four directions the east, the south, the west the North. I thank you for all my relations, the Wingen Nation, the Creeping Crawling Nation, the Four-Legged Nation, the Green and Growing Nation, and all things living in the water, honoring our clans, the deer, the bear, the wolf, the turtle, the snipe. Great Spirit, I thank you today. 
I'd like to sing this. This is my favorite song because it talks about our people and how we communicate and how we how when we have our ceremonies and our gatherings, how we gather together. This song will explain it. It's called and it's for Thanksgiving too because we're we're thanking the Creator for everything. It's called Johnny Cakes and Cranberries. Hey, la, hey, la, hey, la, hey, hey, la, hey, la, hey, la, hey, la, hey, hey, la. Johnny Cake and Cranberries makes a meal for me. A New England Indian is what I'm meant to be. Dancing in the circle, coupled hand in hand. Algonquin families dancing on the sacred land. Hey, la, hey, la, hey, la, hey, hey, la, hey, la, hey, la, hey, la, hey, hey, la. Okanokit, Narragansett, all against all Algonquin bands. These are the children that hold Creator's hand. All tribes are welcome in this special place. Hold up your heads so Creator can see your face. Hey, la, hey, la, hey, la, hey, hey, la, hey, la, hey, la, hey, la. Hey, hey, la. So, thank you. I am also, I walk both, I both, I walk in both worlds. I'm also a descendant from Stephen Hopkins through his son. Um, and being also a, a Poconoke. We call ourselves Poconoke. A lot of people know us as Wampanoags, but that's not the true who we are. The true, our true name would be Poconoke. Um, I've been blessed that my my tribal family found me. I'm one of the lost families of the Massasoit. Um, and when they found me, they found me at a powwow. So I was looking for them for years and they finally found me and they brought me into the tribe and it wasn't too long because I have a lot of knowledge that they didn't have handed down to me from families and cousins and books, family books that were written about our people. The state of Rhode Island at one time wouldn't let our people have their culture. They didn't allow them to learn their culture. So I had a lot of stuff that I could uh, share with my people. And for that, they made me clan grandmother. And what a what an honor to to represent my people that way with the clans. Um, and the Massasoit was a great peacemaker. He met with the pilgrims who formed the peace treaty, and it, it, he's um, one of your ancestors. Your yes, ancestor of his, um, descendant from his brother, right? I'm a descendant from Massasoit's brother, Quarterquinner. They were both greeted the pilgrims, and when Massasoit got sick, uh. Winslow was contacted and he thought Massasoit, he was told that Massasoit had died and he was a good friend. And he came to, he came to our Sagamore. We call him Sagamore or Sagamus. And it's written in the, in the, in the book as Sagamus. Um, he came to help heal, to help, uh, awesome one get better he gave him what they think was chicken soup but i think it was something else because uh, the chicken soup would have been too fatty but uh anyway he helped massasoit get better and and their relate he loved 
and he said to uh, he said to Winslow, "My heart, I will never see anyone like you again." My heart, he was his heart, his heart. He loved him. He loved uh, Winslow. So we had a wonderful relationship for about 50, 54 years, something like that. And I'd like to see that in the world with everyone, not just the Native people, but everyone be at peace. Everyone. We're all brothers and sisters. We're all related somehow. And we need to come together. This, 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 what's going on is horrible. Just horrible. It hurts my heart. And I have a loving heart. <laughs> so I pray, I really pray that we all come together in peace and love and the vibration. Yeah. Wonderful, Betty. Thank you so much. Betty, Barbara, let's 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 have you be Barbara. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much for blessing us with your presence, and we look forward to hearing more from you. Please forgive all the technical problems. I don't know what happened, but oh, but no, we're no worries. It's just important that we all mute while the others speak. Barbara, will you mute yourself? There you go. Good. Perfect. Okay, great. Next? great. Well, we're next, and we're going to do a little, a quick overview of the Pilgrim story and the first great synthesis. We call it the first great synthesis between Europeans and Native Americans, that 54 years of peace and friendship that was established when they met the, in the spring of 1621 and formed a peace treaty with the Massasoit. Osamequin. And um, so we're calling that the first great synthesis. And the second great synthesis being when aspects of the great law of the Iroquois came into the Constitution, which uh, Kevin is going to be speaking on a little later. So, and, and then tomorrow we'll be dealing with what I call the third great synthesis as we open our hearts through the leading edge science that's showing us that we are one with all of creation which the native people have known forever and other, other um, spiritual uh, ascended folks have known and that the Western science, leading edge science is now taking us to that place so we can align with our hearts, get our minds out of the way because it's now going to be in alignment with our hearts and we'll access our, what I call our pan indigenousness, which is that universal thread that we all carry in our hearts. So that'll be tomorrow with physicists and cosmologists and um, astrologists and authors. So um, we're going to share screen and um, <clears throat> and do this little overview. And then Betty will speak. You're good. You're good. Um, You're good. Yeah, I'm good. So then Betty will speak from her perspective. So um, <clears throat> here we go. Let's see, I have to, mm -hmm. yeah, I will. I just have to slideshow, right? You don't want to start from here, do you? Play from start. start from, there you go. Okay. Yeah, here we go. Okay, <clears throat> so this is sacred activism and the origin, evolution, and realization of the American promise from an eagle's perspective. And... So we'll proceed with, let's see. Okay. There you go. Um, it's the pathway to liberty, justice, equality, and abundance for all, humanity's birthright. So when we move into being sacred activists and know our effect on the collective and we act from that place, we will, um, we will bring this to pass on earth in, as, as a higher frequency. So what is spiritual, conscious, subtle activism? Let's see. So. So here's one take on it. Spiritual activism aims to achieve lasting resolution through understanding higher truths and unity, not through legal judgments or partisan legislation. That's from, who was that? Well, it doesn't matter. It's okay. And here's Martin Luther King saying, 
Don't get trapped by pessimism concerning human nature that is not balanced by an optimism concerning divine nature or you will overlook the cure of grace. Wow, that is great. So here are the sacred activisms, activists through time. This way shower to embodying higher law, we recognize this Talk gentleman. about a sacred activist. He was influential and continues to be. Yes, indeed. And we have the Daganawita, <clears throat> the great peacemaker of the Iroquois who came in came to the warring tribes of the Iroquois in the 1200s and brought the great law, which is what we're addressing with the, uh, the aspects of it coming into the constitution. He brought a new way of thinking to the warring people who came together in this great peace and confederacy. So <clears throat> that's a, a key piece of this evolution of consciousness. And we have the separatists who divide their defied their king. These were different from the Puritans. The Puritans wanted to purify the Church of England, and the uh, separatists wanted to uh, know that they had to separate from the Church of England. And so we'll be going into that in more detail. And then the founding fathers of the United States of America in the 1700s, a whole evolutionary vision of how we could conduct ourselves as society. And we have Thoreau, Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr. in the 18 and 1900s, the politics of right action. So they, they stepped forward for that higher truth. And the American transcendentalists of the 1800s. And our beloved John Lennon and his song, Imagine, which can be seen, I think, as a roadmap for how we could do it. It's certainly a vision of a future humanity that I believe John Lennon wanted to see unfold. And I share that dream. Yes. And we and, have Yoda ooh. in the 1900s. <laughs> and Mother Teresa, she says, what, I was once asked why I don't participate in anti-war demonstrations. I said that I will never do that. But as soon as you have a pro-peace rally, I'll be there. How relevant is that today? And we have Standing Rock that brought the tribes together and allies together to, to as protection, as uh, going forward to protect our innate rights to clean water, to freedom. So this is about the evolution of consciousness, these two days. And... It has to do with the innate desire to be free. And uh, we're going to track from monarchy to democracy. So. So King James was an absolute monarch, which was the condition throughout Europe and in many other countries where there was a divine monarch, a king or a queen or a Maharaja or a Caesar <clears throat> who was put in place by God, however people perceived that. And there was they, they were infallible. They, their word was law. And if you disobeyed that word, off with your head. So he was the head of the Church of England. And this is how he responded to this group of separatists who began to agitate for freedom. Remember, the Bible had been translated into English, and suddenly they could read this material without dependence on the ministers. And they saw that the Bible, that the Lord intends us to act according to our conscience, our connection, our direct connection to the divine, however you define that. And it was, that's where we're headed, in my opinion. We're headed to that place of pure, total freedom. But if you are choosing to establish your own church in a land where you had an absolute monarch who was at, also head of the Church of England, this is what you are facing. This is a statement from King James. I will make them conform, or I will harry them out of the land, or do worse. Yes. And these people separated from the church and they formed a covenant that was a, a, a really a, a, a little seed of democracy because it's about the uh, covenant agreement amongst the people. We, the people, democracy is 
the people deciding what's going to uh, come to pass. And here we have, as ye lords free people, we joined ourselves together by a covenant of the Lord into a church estate in ye fellowship of ye gospel to walk in all his ways made known or to be made known to us according to our best endeavor, whatever it should cost us, the Lord assisting us. So this is a, a wonderful explanation. Yes? I just want to say that Scrooby, that interesting word there, is exists today. It's a little tiny, beautiful village right in the middle of England. Yeah. That's where beautiful. this whole thing started that ended up here in Plymouth, Massachusetts. So they had a choice, imprisonment, submission, or flight. And ultimately, they took the choice of flight. And it was against the law to leave without permission. So they had to actually escape England. And here's the the Pilgrim Trail, the Scrooby Covenant in 1606. They escaped from England and arrived in Leiden, Holland in 1609. They were lecturers at Leiden University. And also they were tradesmen because there was a guild system there that wouldn't let them go above um, the, the status of tradesmen. And they then in 1620, they left Holland for America with visions of a society based on freedom of conscience. And in the cabin of the Mayflower in 1620, they signed the Mayflower Compact. They drafted and signed the Mayflower Compact. Right here before coming ashore. And then in 1621, in the spring of 1621, they connected with the Massasoit and the, a creator-based spirituality. And what we're bringing forth is the spiritual alignment of the Mayflower Pilgrim separatists and the native people they encountered, because this is a, both a trust-based paradigm, a, a paradigm that's based on listening to our higher selves, listening to our hearts and acting accordingly. So that's what we're bringing forth is the spiritual beginnings of this nation and, and ultimately the evolution of consciousness that's going to take us to that place of being able to, not only able to, but but uh, aligned with our hearts enough that we choose to act according to our conscience and then having the freedom to do that. And it's all a, a work in process, all of us in this evolutionary upward spiral that we're on individually and collectively. So, so we're calling this the first great synthesis the birth of the American mind, because the American mind was different from the European mind because of its interaction with the native people and this freedom that they saw and, and, and put into play in these documents for us to, to guide us and, and to express what's possible. So they signed the Mayflower Compact on November 11th, 1620 in the cabin of the Mayflower. They met with the Massasoit and formed the Poconoka Treaty in March of 1621. After they hadn't seen, uh, hadn't been had contact with the native people for that first winter, and um, in the March of 1621, they um, met with him and formed this mutual protection treaty. Meanwhile, in, in the in the, during that winter, half of them had died due to scurvy and what they call the general sickness. And these are 102 players, players, people who mothers, dads, and kids who came on the Mayflower to, um, to Plymouth. How many of your ancestors were died? Um, well, several of my ancestors died, leaving a, a, um, a teenage girl named Priscilla who married John Alden and became America's first couple with uh, Henry David, Henry Longfellow speaking <laughs> about the um, uh, speak for yourself, John, in the, um, uh, the the tale of Miles Standish. And so um, we have the three day harvest celebration in the fall of 1621, which was just that the celebration of a good harvest. They came together, 90 native people and 50 
remaining pilgrims, mostly women and children, and they celebrated for three days. And they this peace treaty lasted for 54 years until it ended in King Philip's War, which we won't go into that at this point because so many other people had arrived. So much had gone on over that 54 years that it um, ended in this war that, that shifted the whole relationship between the native people and the, um, and the Europeans. So here we have a scholar speaking on this subject, Reverend Gary Marks, who became a good friend of ours, who's gone now, but here he is. The <clears throat> pilgrims founded their church and their, their whole existence really on a covenant, which was a biblical idea but after having rejected all the forms of uh, the Church of England and indeed the state, the covenant was the foundational first principle of their existence together. They uh, drew up the covenant in 1606 in a speck of a place called Scrooby in England and thereby became separatists. They separated from the Church of England. Because they were based upon a covenant, which means that each party agrees with the other to operate on certain principles, they created a kind of proto-democracy in that each person who was a member of that covenanted church could have a say in the way they made their decisions. Uh, this for them was exclusive to their own congregation, but it had a universal tendency that got put into place when they landed in Plymouth after a long and arduous journey and many frustrations along the way. They finally became a covenanted community uh, and the idea of the covenant expanded itself into the social order, became the Mayflower Compact and they extended the covenant notion to everything they did, eventually into civil and judicial affairs. And uh, it was a grand experiment. And while not uh, equivalent to the Constitution, it at least were, was a seed, a stepping stone, Bradford said, unto more important work yet to be done. The covenant always thought always expressed that God had more to do with them than any one given time. They walked in the ways made known or to be made known to them. And that's an important thing because there is a kind of evolution in, in uh, the meaning of democracy. The pilgrims considered all agreements to be sacred. That was the only sacred thing there was. And uh, they, that applied whether it was to other Europeans or to Native Americans, it was sacred. The idea of mutual benefit one to the other was universal in its application for them. The pilgrims at the time would not have thought that they were making a, a cultural exchange per se. The fact was though that they were they learned certain things from the native peoples and respected that. They also wanted to contribute to, to the native peoples as well, so that there was a cultural exchange. It's just that the cultures were so vastly different from one another. Uh, but they eventually worked things out. So the pilgrim history is a story which has no end. It will end only if people suffer a failure of nerve in the quest for basic human rights. It can honestly be said that all who cherish freedom are pilgrim descendants. Gary Marks, author of Pilgrims Then and Now, which is available in our resources and on the chat. Um, I've asked a friend to put the um, link to that on the chat and have a look at that because that'll give you a really good um, thorough knowledge in a very simple way of this pilgrim story. So we'll carry on. The, 
So now we just bring forth the second great synthesis where aspects of the great law of the Iroquois influences the U.S. Constitution with a, with a drawing of Ben Franklin with the Iroquois in 1754 and uh, the Iroquois at the Continental Congress in 1776. They were actually invent, invited to the Continental Congress in 1776. And Ben Franklin spent a lot of time with the Iroquois and uh, actually um, his Albany plan integrated some of this influence into um, his Albany plan that wasn't accepted, but ultimately it um, moved into the, the constitution. And just a quick correction, the Continental Congress was not 1776, it was 1787. Oh, really? And that's just in the in the PowerPoint. It's, that's the wrong date. Oh, okay. Just, just for those who know, you know, notice such things. Okay. Uh, and one other th thing is important to note is that this is a very controversial subject. Some people say that the whole Constitution came from the Iroquois Great Law, and others say that none of it did. So we're taking that middle ground that was very obvious of the the interaction between the Iroquois and the founders of this nation. And it's also <clears throat> important to understand what the great law was. And do you want to speak on that just a tad? Or I guess we'll leave no, it to I, let, let's to see, Kevin. Let's, let's, let Kevin, let's see what Kevin we'll said. Kevin's Kevin the master of this. He's a, he's a Mohawk. So he is a, a peacemaker himself, following in the footsteps of the great peacemaker who came to the warring tribes of the Iroquois and brought them that higher way of seeing and this this way of organizing themselves so that they had a, a, a political construct within which to be a, a functioning uh, a confederacy. So let's um, just go to this summary of from monarchy to democracy. So if you look at the evolution, let's say the evolution of democracy, but it's also the evolution of human consciousness in a certain sense. So as I said a little a moment earlier, there was a long era, especially in Euro Europe, of the divine king, the absolute monarch. And so this evolution from monarchy to this experiment that we call democracy you can put a beginning on it in England, if you like, in the year 2015 with the Magna Carta. A group of barons got together and demanded rights and very briefly got them. It's a charter of liberties. At the same time, so in England this is going on, at the same time here, the Iroquois Great Law was unfolding, the concept of participatory democracy. Sometime we believe in the 1200s. I believe in the 1200s. Fast forward to 1606 in England, the Scrooby Covenant, this agreement that generated, produced the Mayflower people and a lot of others. Folks ended up all over the place, especially in Holland. The Mayflower crossing the Atlantic, arriving right here in Plymouth, Massachusetts, where before they came ashore, they realized, they recognized the need for an agreement, some sort of a covenant, an agreement among the people on the boat. So that document was drafted and signed on the Mayflower. Con uh, con on the Mayflower. It's called the Mayflower Compact. And, and the Mayflower Compact established that they would create equal and just laws serving the common good, that they would form themselves into a civil body politic. And this compact, the wording of this compact and the intent came through a letter from uh, uh, John Robinson back in Leiden, had sent this letter with them. Who was their minister back who then. Who was their who minister didn't, back didn't there, right. who didn't travel with them. And so this this Mayflower Compact was was spiritually driven to bring forth these principles that were in the Scrooby Covenant and that lay a foundation for this freedom of conscience and enacting equal and just laws. And the word compact in this context means an agreement, the Mayflower Agreement, if you will. Another covenant. Yeah. And then you have the United States Constitution in 1787. So there 
We have it. And the United States is a work in progress, as is all of humanity. We are yet to realize this vision. We are in progress, in process. So we just say, trust the process and take bold, committed action into a higher way of seeing and being, listening to one's heart. We're carrying it in our heart, this true nature of the universe, this this love for all of all of creation that that Barbara expressed in her opening song. So that's it for our um, sharing. We can stop the share. And here we are. Here we are. Thanks, Connie. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. So thank you, Andrew. And now Andrew will speak on on um, New England before the Mayflower. He's done a tremendous amount of research on that. Okay, so I think I showed you earlier a rather weighty looking tome. It's actually an easy read. It's a big, fat, fun book set in the present, but it reflects back to the past. It's a screenplay. We want to make a movie of this at some point. It's a really, really interesting story, this pilgrim story. So if we are to understand what happened in Plymouth, back in 1620 and the years going forward from that. 1620, they arrive, early 1621, they meet the native people and the rest is history. And we know that history. What we don't know necessarily is the prehistory or what happened before that. Because something catastrophic had happened here before the Mayflower landed. Something terrible had happened and it was a disease. And that disease came from somewhere. It's believed to be a European disease, and I believe that as well. I have a different take on it. it was not smallpox for those thing, who think that. It had nothing to do with smallpox and infest, infest blankets, not that. And we won't go there, but if you read the book, you'll see it, it deals with that in depth. So I realized as I started to study this that firstly, there's a lot of misbelief, misinformation. So what is the correct information, the correct belief. What should I believe just as an intelligent human being who wants to understand? I realized I had to go a lot deeper in time. I had to go back. What if I could go back? I had a time machine. I could go back 100 years. What would I have discovered here then before the coming of the French to the north, before the coming of the English here, and maybe around the time of the coming to, of the Spanish down to the south? So back deeper in time and much wider in space. You can't come to Plymouth right now and find the facts. There's nobody here. There's nobody who was there then. There's a lot of writings and history and, and theories and, and a lot of to, to learn here. But you can't understand what happened without understanding the context within which it happened. So the Mayflower landed. What did they land? How, when they came ashore, what was the situation on the ground? And what it led up to this, the, their, their, literally their ability to land here safely. Because let's go back just to 1614. A man named John Smith, Captain John Smith, very English sounding name, arrived here and he was on a mission. He was working for someone in England and his job was to map this area to sail around, look at it, consider it, literally considering it for his boss for establishing a colony. Okay, 1614, he pulled up right over there, looking out of the window at where he would have pulled in, and he estimated that there were 2,000 warriors in Patuxet, which is the native name for this place, where which is now called Plymouth. So the Patuxet people, Estimated to somehow he did some sort of count of warriors. He didn't count the women and children. It was all sort of on, oh, they can bring up this many warriors. He did the same thing on this entire coastline. And he came up with a whole lot of people. The coastal natives were multitudes. Okay, something happened to them. Something happened to them because six years later, when the Mayflower pulls in, the entire coast was devastated. This pandemic had come down the coast and eradicated a whole lot of people. But what was the situation? We could go to the reason for the pandemic. I have an entire theory on that that's been looked at by some major scholars and said, yeah, that makes better sense than anything I've seen so far. 
But the, the situation at the time was the Iroquois Confederacy was the dominant factor, the dominant military and political force in the Northeast. So if you go into present day upstate New York to the Great Lakes and across into Canada, you've got the five nations who became the six nations who became, as a result of their confederacy, extremely powerful. So they pretty much controlled the whole place. The Pequots to the south had a major role in enforcing things and collecting tribute because it was this whole thing of these tributary tribes. It's a complex, interesting, fascinating story. And to the north, we had the people today we call the Mi'kmaq of Nova Scotia. They, in those days, were called by a very interesting word, Tarotine. And Tarotine's obviously not a native word. It sounds English or European. It's actually Basque. Basque fishermen who have been coming here for hundreds of years realized that this area had been discovered by Europeans and they discovered the, the St. George's banks and this incredible fishing resource. So these boats were coming over and loading up with fish and taking them back. And of course, there were these interactions with the natives. The Basques called them the Tarotians. Today, we call them the Mi'kmaqs. And the Penobscots to the south of them on either side, I believe, of the St. Lawrence River, so to the north. And those were the two major tribes. There were many others. There were the Passamaquoddy and many other tribes. But what had happened is that there was a, in the midst of all of this, who should arrive but the French up north? And what should arrive as a business opportunity to eat but the beaver trade? All of a sudden, everyone in Europe wants to wear a beaver hat. And because of this market for beaver hats in Europe, the French started talking to the natives and finding that there were ways of, you know, you'd have to go up the rivers and talk to the folks. Connie, what's up? Just, just, we have not too much time left for you. So How much just, more time do I have? Um, about four minutes. Okay. So I'd asked a question earlier, what happened before the Mayflower? And I'm telling you what happened before the Mayflower. Okay. okay. I'll get there. Yeah. So it was about the fur trade that was entirely run by the French at that time. And this is in the late 1500s into the very early 1600s. And 1607, a conflict broke out between the Tarotines, Mi'kmaq, and the Penobscots. And they actually started having skirmishes because they both wanted control of the trade. So here we are, human beings doing what human beings do, competing for the market. A very serious conflict broke out where the Mi'kmaq had broken through to the Penobscot and actually killed the leader, the Bishaba, the leader of the Penobscot, wiped out his entire family, and there was a major change in the demographic at that moment. What happened down here, this area of Plymouth, was basically dominated by a Sachem or a Sagamore named Nana Pashamut. And Nana Pashamut had a compact, an agreement, with the Penobscot up north. And his job, once the Penobscot was in trouble, the runners arrived, said, hey, we've got a problem, help. And they raced up north and to help. And they actually punched through, managed to kill a bunch of Mi'kmaq, Tarotine folks. And I believe they actually stole some women and children and they came back down here big mistake. It's like you're in the woods and there's a hornet's nest and you go punch your fist into that hornet's nest and then walk away like nothing happened. What did happen? War canoes, birch bark war canoes came down en masse down the coast and proceeded to wreak revenge, vengeance on anyone they could find, which is all the coastal tribes. Unbeknownst to those folks, they were carrying a bacteria that had come all the way from Europe across on the French boat, a rat brought it ashore, and all of a sudden there's this thing called bubonic plague in the bloodstream of the native people. And bubonic plague spreads very slowly unless you have a malnourished community, and I'll end with this. What, what more obvious cause of malnutrition than war? that prevents you from growing your crops that you would grow in the summertime on the coast. So here come these war canoes, 
people ran away, they couldn't grow their crops. And in that hand-to-hand -hand battle, the disease was transmitted. And once you're malnourished, bubonic plague turns to pneumonic plague. Now coughs and sneezes spread diseases, as is well known in England. And these folks who had no resistance whatsoever died. And that's what had happened before the Mayflower arrived. So they would never have been able to land in John Smith's time, only six years earlier. And in that interim, everything shifted. So they were able to come and land here and the place was deserted. There were skeletons and skulls on the foreshore. Something dreadful had happened. They didn't know what it was. I think that's what it was. Okay. Yes, and we we go into the emotional state oh, yeah. of the folks. Okay, this is, this is, and I've never heard a historian or an academic discuss this, but just imagine on the spring equinox of 1621, here comes the Massasoit, the leader of the Poconoka tribe, and they were 46 miles away in present-day um, Rhode Island, Mount Hope. They arrive. There's this sit-down. There's some fire water share, and there was all sorts of, there's a very interesting description of it. They crafted this peace agreement, which lasted for 54 years. And this was Massasoit and his Poconoga people who namely also the Patuxent people with their 2,000 warriors. Now there were 90 warriors. See the difference? To the south were the Narragansetts. The disease never got there. They had 3,000 warriors. Massasoit and his people could have been wiped out in a moment if, if they decided to do that. And all of these tribes were in some potential of conflict. So, and the Mayflower people had landed and 102 came ashore. And by the spring, there were 51 left. Exactly half of them died, probably from certain microorganisms in the water that they were unfamiliar with. It happened in a lot of other colonies. So if you look at that, half of the settlers die of just from drinking the water. So now you've got this devastated group of English people here. They've just lost half their people. Connie's ancestors are gone, except for one of the five who landed. And the natives have lost 90% of the people. So think about the grief, think about the emotional state and think about the security and the joy of finding a friend and the security and the potential of this brand new relationship and this brand new friendship. Today, we call it Thanksgiving. Yes, and it wasn't the first Thanksgiving for them. For the for the pilgrims, they had been celebrating the harvest, and the native people had been celebrating the harvest forever. So we've dubbed it the first Thanksgiving, um, which happened later in American history to make turn this into the first Thanksgiving. But it simply was a festivity a for festivity. three days of man. Oh. They they have blast of, of gratitude. There's this and, outburst of gratitude and intercultural. Wow, what an extraordinary thing. I want to go there. An exception to the human condition happened right here during that 54 years. And so we want to celebrate that. And we'd like to bring on now Betty Booth Donahue, who will give her perspective from a scholarly uh, point of view. And let me say that she is an expert in these matters. She lives far away, but she knows a lot about right here. She knows a lot more than I do. And she's the author of Bradford's Indian book, which shows the, the influence of the native people on the pilgrim thinking, which is just so important for the synthesis idea to come forth. So Betty, um, please share what your vision and knowledge is. Thank you, Connie. I'm very happy to participate in this meeting. Uh, I neglected to say in my introduction that not only am I Cherokee, but I also descend from one of the Mayflower passengers, from Francis Cook. Cook lived across the street from Bradford, and they seem to know each other rather well. It's important as Andrew has intimated to point out that Osumikin and John Carver have left us a perfect example of how indigenous wisdom and insight, coupled with European adaptivity, 
can bring forth a new world. And at this time of political crisis, we should pay close attention to what they did and we should act accordingly. I discuss something in my book that I call the Plymouth Paradigm, a phrase that refers to the fact that for the first 50 years of Plymouth's existence, there was relative peace between the Wampanoags and the Plymouthians. There were, of course, some notable exceptions, the most egregious of which were the murders of Pecsuit, Lichuamut, and possibly as many as five other men. According to Edward Winslow, this unprovoked attack caused great chaos and fear in the Native community. But even though the ensuing unrest caused psychological confusion and trauma and sent many Natives into hiding in swamps, somehow the peace held. It possibly held for several very pragmatic reasons. The Eastern Woodland tribes were distressed. Their numbers had been ravaged by disease, food shortages, the deaths of trusted leaders, alien invasion, and cultural uncertainty. The Algonquians' options were few, and their ability to respond with any kind of deadly effectiveness was virtually nil. One could speculate that their only practical choice, other than putting into place economic sanctions, which they did, was to do nothing openly provocative and just hope for the best. For the other side and for this outrage, the leaders at Plymouth were severely chastised by their spiritual mentor, the Reverend Mr. John Robinson in Holland, who wrote them that their job in New England was to save the natives, not kill them. His severe and direct critique of these murders lasted as long as Bradford Brewster and Edward Winslow were in charge of Plymouth. So it seems then that the peace held because one group was helpless to do otherwise, and the other group forbidden to. That this era of peace came to fruition is due partly to the fact that the Plymouthian leaders realized from the start that they must that they that they must alter their normal behavioral protocols in this new land. The rather extreme separatists or Brownists at Plymouth favored a plain style sort of rhetoric of worshiping and of living. They were against clerical regalia, gold altar ornaments, elaborate cathedrals, and ecclesiastical formality. However, when these simple men were organizing their first official meeting with the Poconokets, whom they regarded to be royalty, they tried to make the affair formal. Mort's relation notes that as the Massasoit entered the compound, the pilgrims placed before him a green rug and three or four cushions. Then instantly came the governor, Carver, with drum and trumpet after him and some few musketeers. After salutations, the governor kissing his hand, the king kissed him, and so they sat down. The governor called for some strong water and drunk to him, and he drunk a great draught that made him sweat all the while. He called for a little fresh meat, which the king did willingly eat and shared with his followers. Then they treated to peace. Now, for people who prefer plain style, detest ritual pomp and circumstance, this protocol seems something of a departure from normal behavior of brownest operations. Hand kissing, cushions, sitting on the ground, toasting, what's happening here? And in addition to this strange brownest behavior, 
It's important to note that earlier, the Indians had already decided how this meeting would be conducted and consequently held to their traditional ways in regards to its materialization. The presence of Tisquantum, an apprentice shaman, emphasized the notion that the Massasoit intended this meeting to have his desired outcome. The attendance of high-ranking tribal officials, the time of the event to coincide with the vernal equinox, the seven-day time frame, the ritual preparation by chiefs and medicine men, the ceremonial regalia, the singing and dancing, the corn and tobacco offerings before and after the actual gathering, and the leaving a man to leave it, live in a colony suggest that this parley was something much more than a let's get acquainted affair. These details suggest an all-encompassing effort to modify or Indianize the behavior of the Plymouthian band. It was a significant exchange designed to bring the newcomers into the American Indian ethos or into the native way of acting and living. The details of this first meeting and what they symbolize are vital now, not only to American survival, but also to global. Rapidly accelerating climate change, exploding populations, world drought and water shortages, rampant starvation, deteriorating economies, and the rise of authoritarian dictators clearly indicate that we must go back to recognizing the wisdom of Native peoples everywhere. Leave off belittling and marginalizing them and seek to understand and adopt their traditions, especially the concept of living in harmony with the earth, not as using it as an everlasting ATM machine. Of course, not only must non-Indians change their values and life ways, but American Indians must take a deep breath put aside their well-earned resentments, and be willing again to teach, explain, and demonstrate a more balanced and peaceful way of coexisting with the earth and with all living things. What up? Wonderful, Betty, thank you so much. I just hope people will listen to that many times and learn from you the depth and breadth of what you're bringing forth from your understanding of that time and from your understanding and vision for humanity and the importance of Native people now at this time. That's the and point. <laughs> that's the point of bringing the Native people into their proper place in this evolution of consciousness that became the United States of America and, and those principles upon which it stands, that promise we made to the world in these documents as from the, those influences of the, the Europeans and the native people, because we're in process to get there. That's what it's all about in my world. And so we hope that this forum has given people some insights into into that vibratory level that we can go to, to take that eagle's perspective on the unfolding of humanity's gift to all of creation. And we're going to be learning tomorrow from the physicists and um, the um, cosmologists. We're going to be learning that it is a holographic universe. We are all of creation. What we do matters. What we think, what we what we do, what we feel matters to all of creation. So that's um, a very important um, perspective, Betty, and that, that Barbara has brought as well. And we just hope that people take this into their hearts. And I don't know if Kevin is here. Um, he had to step away. So we, I think he's not back yet. <clears throat> so why don't we bring Jim on 
and have a conversation. And we can bring Kevin in because we we very well addressed that that first great synthesis time of the of the pilgrims and the native people. And let's um, have a little discussion about that and bring Kevin in for this what we call the, the second great synthesis the grand finale when <laughs> when he gets back. So, Jim. Um, what have you been thinking as you've listened to all this and from your vast knowledge of history, of the future, of from the spiritual perspective? I know you have a, a degree from Harvard Divinity School. So you you bring to this conversation that high vibration while addressing the situation of where we're at as uh, this at this point in time in this process. So Jim. We'd love to have your insights and qu questions to our folks. Well, thank you, first of all, all of you. It's, it's so striking that uh, that each of you, in one way or another, trace ancestry. You know, back to to Mayflower and Betty and Barbara uh, trace it both to the the uh, Europeans and back uh, through your bloodline to the native peoples. So you in some ways carry American history uh, in your bodies and in your, your ancestral memory. And so there's deep wisdom there. So I just want to acknowledge that uh, and thank you uh, for it. And I just wanted to bring in, uh, and then maybe starting with you, Betty, since you're the uh, historian, uh, you know, in, in terms of American literature, and also uh, you, Andrew, you know, the insights that are provided by uh, David Graeber and David Wingro in their book, uh, The Dawn of Everything, where they uh, expand what you were talking about, about, you know, specifically the Mayflower uh, and the Plymouth Colony right there as a microcosm. But what they bring in is that uh, the, the entire uh, Native American ethos was actually carried from North America via the French, uh, you know, later uh, in the 17th century uh, after the Mayflower landed. And it was the Native American critique of uh, French and European hierarchy, uh, orthodox religion, and coercive government, and their espousal of uh, individual rights and the individual uh, uh, right in particular for mobility and to speak one's uh, own opinion freely to the chief that according to uh, Grieber and, and, and Wengro, was actually the genesis of the very impulses that then ignited the American Revolution. So it wasn't simply that, you know, the Iroquois helped Benjamin Franklin and others kind of write the Constitution, uh, but that there was a much bigger historic transfer of political philosophy from uh, North America uh, to Europe, uh, and then back to North America. And so uh, maybe starting with you, Betty, would love to have your comment on that, because uh, I was very struck when I read that, uh, that, that book. And then, Andrew, uh, anything that you want to say, and then uh, Connie, uh, Barbara, Kevin, et cetera. Uh, thank you. Uh Unfortunately, I'm not familiar with this book. I, I oh. will have to get it. And yeah, I know that for centuries before 1620, there was a lot of intercourse between Europe and North America. The Vikings, the Irish, the Chinese, I mean, everybody was here. And they were taking information back with them. So mm -hmm. I, I grant them that, that that was certainly true. Mm -hmm. um, my take on this general process for the United States is that what happened was 
more or less a spiritual thing. And it, um, it, the fallout from that would of course been political, but the, the power behind it was the fact that both the pilgrims and the natives were highly spiritual people. And they both believed in the power of the word, either written or spoken. Mm -hmm. And it's this word power that caused things to happen. And um, then from that came the rest of the exchanges. And we know from French writers that there was a big interest an interest that still goes on about American Indians and their culture and their ways of thinking and doing things. But I, I think it was this word power that was floating around and that both people absorbed. The um, Indians complained about the noises the pilgrims made, the shooting, the shouting, the unruly kids, the this and that. Then the the pilgrims complained about the howling of the savages the chanting the singing so they were both getting earfuls of each other's words and i believe that this is really what motivated all these subsequent changes mm. Mm. well thank you for that there's no doubt that there was an ethos, both a, a, a kind of a clash of civilizations, but also a curiosity between the civilizations as they first encountered each other uh, in a sustained way. Um, but I would recommend this book, uh, Betty, uh, The Dawn of Everything by David Graeber, G-R-A-E-B-E-R, -E -E and David Wingrow, W-E-N-G-R-O-W, uh, because they really provide an in-depth historical um, chronology that certainly I and most of the people I know have had never uh, uncovered. Uh, but uh, the, the conclusion uh, was that uh, the uh, Native American uh, uh, impulse around human rights uh, and uh, local democracy was brought into Europe by uh, Native Americans, uh, and it wasn't the other way around. We have this notion that it came out of Judeo-Christianity and was somehow a European uh, development, uh, but Graeber and, and Wingro argue, in my mind, persuasively, that that was actually not the case. And, and uh, uh, I can uh, look it up, uh, but it's a very compelling uh, piece of information uh, that actually was was started by a French aristocrat that went to Quebec, and it was around Lake Huron, uh, where he encountered uh, a Native American uh, a warrior in chief. And to your point, he was so eloquent with his words that he was recognized as a genius and the director general of uh, Quebec, the French director general, allowed this French aristocrat uh, to uh, bring this chief into the court and they had these salons. And he uh, then went to France uh, uh, and stayed for about six months during which he articulated uh, such a compelling critique that that began to spread uh, among the literati of Europe. And most of the books uh, that uh, were written between about 1700 and, and 1800, 1820 uh, in Europe referred to natives, sometimes savages, but natives that spoke these words because it was a punishable offense in Europe at that time to talk about civil liberties and human rights 
because it was considered a violation of Catholic dogma. So it was put in the, the mouths, as it were. This is your point. The words came from the Native Americans right. in such a compelling way that even Rousseau, Voltaire, uh, Montesquieu uh, were quoting them, um, both for personal safety, but also because that was the origin point. So anyway, this notion of the word uh, is, is very important. And uh, I think you'll find the book uh, uh, very uh, uh, interesting. But Andrew, what, what, what is your comment on these things? You having written this vast novel. <laughs> So, Jim, um, firstly, that's very, I, I too am not familiar with the book. Is it recent? Yeah, it came out um, three or four years ago. No, I have not caught uh, up. And it's, it's uh, I think it's a must read. Yeah, I've got for it. Anyone wanting to get into the deeper layers of real history. That's what you're bringing out today, is yeah. the real history in so kind of a vertical way. And, yeah. and I'm bringing in sort of that real history in a horizontal, contextual way. So I think this is really, really interesting is how much of the native spirit understanding uh, wisdom made its way to Europe in the early days, long before, the, I would say very long, very a great hundreds of years prior to the to 1776. And that whole thing, go back to, for example, George Weymouth, who was an English seaman who came over here. And whether he, whether they were volunteers or whether he kidnapped them, I don't know. But five or six natives from right here were taken back to England. The famous Squanto to Squantum either volunteered or was kidnapped. And we don't know that either. It's not known, really knowable. But he went, he spent six years in England, came back here and happened to be around when the Mayflower arrived, he spoke fluent English, like the English had spent six years in London. And point being that groups of natives had made their way to Europe yes. from a very long time ago, from, yeah. from the 1500s. And that influence had begun back then. And they were fascinating too. I think there was a huge fascination. And there was, of course, a romanticization as well. So the whole sort of noble savage idea and so on that these people are absolutely perfect and they live perfectly in this paradise. You know, that that dream, which we know there was an awful lot of other stuff going on here back in those days. However, the fascination of Europeans for native culture. I'll speak yes. for myself. I grew up in South Africa. As an eight-year-old, I got my library card for the first time. And I used to go to the library and come back with books about America and about the early days. And I still remember them and they were adult books. And my parents would take them away from me because I wasn't supposed to be reading this stuff. They'd hide it on top of the cupboard and I'd go climb up and get it off and continue reading. <laughs> I too have had a fascination for a long time. And yeah, yeah. Now, yeah, yeah. you said one other thing, you said each of the people on this panel trace their ancestry back to the pilgrims. This is true with one exception. I just married one. However, I did sail across here in 1969. I did arrive on Thanksgiving day of 1969. So I am, and I claim this, a Latin <laughs> pilgrim. Honorary. Honorary. <laughs> but what I want to say is that we, we saw the Magna Carta. We saw things happening in Europe that that expressed this desire to be free this this foundational principles so right. it, it indeed is a synthesis of the innate human desire to be free our knowing that we uh, have this birthright to be fr truly free and the native people are carrying keys to this and but <clears throat> it, it it it's just so important to to understand the universality of our knowing, of our deep desire, and and the progress towards that, and without yeah. emphasizing one or another and demonizing one or over another or whatever, because in my view we've we've been out of balance for millennia due to a lower vibration, a lower frequency that everyone has been, all races, yellow red, white, and black have been influenced by. And so even though we have the great law 
and we have the Mayflower Compact, we have this, that, the other thing. We have the Christian church. And the yeah. Christian church, I mean, the Christian church based on Jesus who had that high vision and the great law of the Iroquois had a high vision. But what did we do with it all? What did the Iroquois Confederacy do? They became the greatest military force in the Northeast and annihilated others around them, other tribes, okay? So, and what did the United States do with its high document? It became this universal imperial power. So uh, we, we have these models of, of what we can be and what we're in process of becoming now that the earth is in a higher frequency. So it's, I think it's just so important to recognize that universal aspect of it all, of, of the frequency that exists that we're responding to and the free will to shift our frequency mm -hmm. so that our reality, our personal reality shifts and the reality of humanity shifts into a, a higher way of being, which, uh, and I see that the, the laws are expanded in the higher frequency. So we're going into a whole new era of, of that we can't even fathom that humanity rising is taking us to and, and so many other uh, forums and and it's just what's up. So we're if we listen closely and we we hear that that we're going to a higher way of being. And but it's up to us to choose it. And that's what this forum is about to give us the tools to choose spiritual activism, sacred activism, so that we go into the oneness of all things and say yes, yes. I like Mother Teresa. Uh, I will come to a pro-peace rally, but don't ask me to come to a, uh, an anti-war um, rally. And so much is happening right now with all the war that's going on and the, and the, and the history that goes into all that. We just have to stay focused and move into a higher vibration. Well, thank you uh, for those uh, concluding comments, uh, Connie and uh, Andrew uh, and Betty. I uh, deeply appreciate this. You know, when you go back into history and it's like an archaeological dig, you know, you're you're uh, you have to go through layers and layers and layers to really begin to honor the complexity and the synergies that were happening in real time that are forgotten as as memory takes over. And then you start something like the Thanksgiving holiday and then it gets envelops in the patriotism and then this romanticized view uh, that gets more and more romantic as the actual event recedes in time. <laughs> so finally, all you got is, uh, you know, turkey and dressing. Uh, and, but, and, uh, but it's also and, been, it's also been maligned with misinformation. In yeah, fact, yeah, yeah. it was yeah. a three-day celebration, simple, simply that to yeah. cultures coming together and eating and enjoying each other for three days. I mean, what an extraordinary exception to the human yeah. condition. Exactly. And that's the origin of this nation, the spiritual beginning of this nation, peace, friendship, and gratitude. The vibration of gratitude, we all know that that's a hugely high vibe. And, and that's how this nation began with peace, gratitude, and intercultural interaction. Betty, do you have some, anything to say to, to finish us off? No, I can't think of a thing, but I've truly enjoyed this and I've learned so much from all of you. I appreciate it. Well, we're so having, we're so sorry that Kevin got called away. Um, we'll just have to bring him on another and for, time. And for this English South African who sailed across here in 69, I'm so glad that I found you, my Native American friends. You are a blessing and important to the world and to the future of the world. As is Jim Garrison, who is doing this humanity rising exploration and bringing this high vibe solution uh, into this process. So um, thank you, Jim, for, for seeing what's going on, addressing what's going on and taking us on that road to a higher vibration because that the only way out is up. Totally, transcend and include, no doubt about it. There you are. So, thank you everyone. Uh, thank you, Connie and Andrew and Betty and Barbara and Kevin. This has been a magnificent 
uh, beginning uh, for us will conclude tomorrow uh, with a uh, final program on uh, this first Thanksgiving and the traditions and mythologies and layers uh, of history and myth. And then uh, uh, that'll bring us to a close for today. You're all welcome to the after session chat. You'll see the link in the chat box. Stan just put it in. For those of you who are watching passively on Facebook or YouTube or LinkedIn, uh, you're more than welcome uh, to join us as well. Uh, you receive the Zoom link in your Zoom reminder, and then we'll see everybody tomorrow uh, for our final session. Thank you, everyone. Bye for now. Bye-bye.